Welcome to the Chooseify radio podcast. We view the concept of financial independence as a life optimization strategy that helps you crush the game using a mixture of conventional and unconventional methods. My name is Jonathan Mendonza, a pharmacist pursuing financial independence, and my co-host name is Brad Barrett, a CPA turned entrepreneur who reached financial independence through diligent savings and online business ventures. We host a twice a week show on Mondays and Fridays that focuses on living below your means, creating multiple income streams, straightforward investment strategies, tax optimization hacks, and travel rewards. This is what winning looks like. Welcome to the show. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys. Well, today we're going to be discussing the this past week's episode where we talked with Travis Shakespeare about the manifest destiny of Phi and specifically his journey to financial independence and what this meant for the Phi community in the context of a documentary that's going to be released at the beginning of 2019. So to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? I am doing quite well, Jonathan. Yeah, that was a good episode with Travis on Monday. I, I really enjoyed it. And certainly learning more about the Playing With Fire documentary, how Travis got included in the project and, and the amazing story behind that. It's it's just a neat thing. And yeah, looking forward to chatting with you. But yeah, what's going on by you? Well, I guess the place I wanted to start is my wife has become an expert at Buy Nothing Groups. And this is incredible because a year ago, we didn't know that they existed. But due to this community talking about life hacks and getting the most out of their individual communities, uh, they have come on our radar. And for those of you that are just hearing about this for the first time, I am not an expert at this. My wife has just started it, but I see the benefit and I see the overlap for our community. And as we talk about efficient living and trying to do things in a slightly smarter way while involving your community, I think this is a conversation worth having. My very basic understanding, though, is that it's mostly taking place on like Facebook groups, closed Facebook groups for individual areas, and you join, and the main rule is you're not selling anything. And so you're offering stuff that you no longer have any use for back to this community of people. You're not charging for it, but you're not. You're also not giving it to the very first person that asks for it. When someone offers something up, people reply in the comments, and they don't just say, hey, I want it, but they tell you why they want it, how they would use it, maybe a little bit about themselves. That has two purposes. One, it really gets people involved in the process, and now you're attaching a face to it. So what this does over time is it instills gratitude. I mean, it's just, it's really cool. And so my wife has received a few items for our son. So she's looking for different toys and, you know, we, we have seen these exact items on the shelf, but she's in this buy nothing group. And I guess families that aren't, don't need it anymore are offering it up. And she's, so she'll post a message like, oh, this is exactly what I've been looking for. I can visualize our son standing on the first stool of the step as he brushes his teeth. And then, you know, someone picks her for this, for this item, like they're blessing her with this gift. And as a result of that, immediately in her own mind, gratitude has been turned on. And now she's looking through our house for what she can give back to this community. And it like instills gratitude. It's extraordinarily powerful and it's brand new to my world. That's really cool. And it's so interesting how all this stuff ties together as you're talking about this, which I've frankly never, never known anything about buy nothing groups. I've, I've heard of the term in passing and I do want to ask you more about it, but these responses, and it reminds me of what Travis said, which is quote, story is central to the human existence. How interesting is that? Danny has to come up with this thing about your son standing on the first step and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That is what gets people to pick her. It's not just, hey, I'm first. I asked for it. I get it. People want to connect. And that that really is what that is. That's human connection. And that's absolutely fascinating. And I'm curious. So, okay, are there 
any like admission requirements? So this buy nothing, is this just like a general ethos that like some of these people are literally trying to buy nothing or is it just that nothing is for sale in these groups? Talk me through that. Yeah, I am the worst representative of this community, totally looking at it as a fascinated outsider. But my understanding is that this is an organization that started something. I'd actually love to research it more. I'm sure that there are many people in our community that are deeply involved in this and can give us more information. So definitely reach out. But here's my understanding. The ethos in this group is that you're just not selling anything. It's not so much that you don't buy anything ever. It's just that in this group, you bring a spirit of giving. And so you can post on this group something that you're looking for, you know, a need or a want, or you can post something that you want to give. And so the conversation can start either way, but it fosters a dynamic that is so radically different from everything else that you see in society that in my mind, there's a play here for our local groups to start linking to buy nothing groups and suggesting that maybe people get involved. It's powerful, man. What happens almost overnight, the first time that you see someone offering something and then you post your personal, somewhat vulnerable story of why you think that, you know, why you want this particular item and the person actually brings it to your home and puts it on the front door. Now you've just connected yourself to a community. And then how much more does that make, you know, you want to do it for the next person? I can tell you that donating to like a Goodwill where it may or may not end up in a landfill is not a very gratifying feeling. I mean, for the optimizers, they simply get their receipts and then their only goal is to to get the write-off at the end of the year. Now with the new, the way the new tax system is structured, you're not even going to get a write-off. I mean, no one is going to break it into the itemization on a middle-class salary. Without that even marginal incentive, how cool is it that there is a community of people that is focusing maybe even unintentionally on inspiring gratitude? Yeah, I completely hear you about the gratitude. And it, it reminds me of one thing that we did in the past week. We volunteered a friends of ours are, are members of a local church and they invited us to volunteer during this event. And it was through an organization called Feed My Starving Children. I really haven't volunteered with my kids at any point previously, which is kind of sad, but the four of us went to this event for, for two hours and we just had a lot of fun. It was basically packaging up these meals for starving children in Haiti. That's where these meals were going. And there was, it, it was just set up so wonderfully from like a fun perspective, especially for little kids, because they knew they were going to have dozens, if not hundreds of kids volunteering. And we got to scoop out the ingredients and put them in the bag and seal them up. And then my little daughter, Molly, got to put them in the box. And at the end, they counted up all these meals that we had packaged up over the course of of 90 plus minutes. And they equated it to the number of children that would eat for an entire year in this one particular village. It really hit home to my kids on a level that I didn't anticipate. And I think there was that level of of gratitude, actually, that I don't think they ever really understood, even though I try to tell them how fortunate we are in life. It, it's difficult to see unless they see what other people's lives look like and what, in, in this unfortunate case, what true suffering looks like. And there were these videos that they played and they showed like what these children were eating before these meals came. And Uh, you know, in prior years. And it, again, it hit home on a level that I didn't anticipate. And it's something that we're definitely going to do in the future. So that was really quite a fun time. And for anybody out there, you know, I didn't know this organization and this certainly isn't, isn't the only one, but if you can volunteer with your kids, even at a soup kitchen or just anywhere in, in the local area, I think it's time well spent. I mean, we, we had a really good time as a family and we did some good on, on a Saturday morning where we really wouldn't have been doing anything else. It's almost an adventure. I mean, that's what it was like. It it really was was an outing, but doing something good. And and it was a fun family time. So that's something I'm going to look into much more often now. I love the idea of engaging your family and doing something that's just slightly unconventional. Uh, I can tell you it's something that appeals to me. And we continue to look for different sorts of opportunities just at a personal level. I'd love to go back and talk for a few minutes about this episode that we had with Travis on Monday. And in particular, the place that I wanted to start was his vision of the Phi community and by extension, the documentary being a giant call to action for like potentially a consumer world that's just lost its way. Yeah. He said something to the effect of this doc can be a call to action and put it in front of these people and show them that this can be a reality for so many people. When they first hear about financial independence, it sounds a little far out there, 
But when you see people doing it, it's incontrovertible at that point. It's real. And Travis said that film is different from almost every other medium in that there's music, there's pictures, there's words, and it puts you, as he said, in this deep emotional state. The way that Travis and Scott are putting this this doc together, this is about story. I mean, first and foremost, it's about Scott and Taylor's story of finding the Phi community, but it's also about the greater Phi community in general and how people are living their different lives, but how real it is. That's the beautiful part. And and yeah, I'm I'm fascinated to see how this can expand the pie, if you will, of this entire community. Because right now, it's a small subculture, as as we referred to it on the, the Monday episode. But it doesn't have to be. There's nothing radical about what we're doing. We've just chosen to live below our means and to focus essentially on happiness and freedom. Those aren't radical thoughts. That's not something that we should be unusual or counterculture or anything. We've just decided there are things that are important to us in life and there are things that aren't. And for me, the things that aren't are fancy cars, impressing my friends, buying expensive clothes and watches and things like that and living in a big house. I don't care about that stuff, but I do care about my time and my freedom. And for me, living well below my means and saving money allows me to get the things in life that I want. So I think there are many millions of people that can latch onto this concept. They just need to be presented with it in a manner that resonates with them. And I think that's the crucial part. But the poetic justice of the platform of film being used to carry this message is that it's almost unwinding what's been done to us as a society over the last 20, 30 years. I mean, if you think about it, the very same reasons that Travis loves film is why marketing has been so powerful for so long. It, it has captivated us in all these different levels. And, and I love the idea that we can use that same platform to unwind it and give people back the control of their lives and help them reorient what's actually bringing them value. You don't realize what a number marketing has done to you until you see someone that's made a different choice, right? Yeah, I mean, you're saying that it's aspirational, right? And it can be for good or ill, essentially, if I can put words in your mouth. You're saying that marketing, it does a great job because film or commercials or whatever you want to call it, that it hooks you. And I totally get that. And also we can, we as a Phi community and this documentary can make it aspirational to live like many of us do, which is again, focusing on different things from normal society, not on actual tangible things, but on relationships and learning and doing things that you truly want to do in your life when these finite years you have on earth and not clocking in nine to five every day forever just to afford these things that you're really not using, right? Because you're sitting in a job all day. So that's, it's such an interesting rethink. And like to us, it seems patently obvious. And, and I know I'm saying this kind of tongue in cheek, but that this is the way to live. But so many people just have not unplugged from the matrix in, in that sense and even understood that this is possible. Who thinks it's possible to retire in your 30s or 40s and never work again? That is a counterculture idea just because people aren't aware of it. Hopefully a documentary like this with widespread circulation can make a huge difference and make this something that does go mainstream or if not mainstream, then, then a whole lot closer. You know, if it does go mainstream, I think it will be because our quote unquote subculture that I identify with, that I am thrilled to be a part of is shouting it from the rooftops, right? I mean, this, this, this is our documentary. This documentary is, is our story. There's ownership here. We're, we're tied to it almost in a very tangible way. And th what Scott is doing is he is being the flag bearer, right? And taking it to people that have never considered it, have never been shown it, have never, never realized that there was another way to reach financial independence outside of becoming the owner of a billion dollar company. I think honestly, up and that, that was the biggest light bulb moment for me with the Phi community is that there was more 
than one way to financial independence and that our community was doing it in such a myriad of different ways. There's this feeling as you grow up and you're exposed to e true Hollywood stories of the lifestyles of the rich and famous that the only way to be independent, to be wealthy is to either be a celebrity or have a massive business. And it's patently untrue and it's patently ridiculous. But honestly, those are the only stories that you're exposed to. And marketing has an incentive to make you think that in order to reach any sort of financial success, you need to spend lots of money. You need to spend money to make money. You need to dress like the person that you want to be. It can be a dangerous path to go down because it can dig you into a very deep hole. And our community, more so than any other community that's out there, just figured out how to go back to the math, go back to the basics, and then based on a very simple equation, break the game a thousand different ways. And honestly, Brad, that's what we've been trying to do is highlight on our particular platform, which is audio, people's unique stories. Yeah, and and that reminds me of a quote that Travis said, which was, human beings have the unique capacity to transform their story into reality. Again, story is central to the human existence. The stories that we tell ourselves have the power to shape our world. And that's an important part, to shape our world. You can look at any situation negatively or positively. It's that story that you're telling yourself that makes all the difference in the world. So like Travis said, he could be bemoaning the traffic that's there in LA and look at all these cars, so many people in my way. Or he could say, hey, this is a great opportunity to listen to the Choose a podcast, he said, and be inspired by the stories you're hearing on the podcast. What a cool rethink. And, and it sounds trite, but, but it isn't. This is the key to happiness. This is the key to looking, in my opinion, at, at life in the right way is just reframe the situation, reframe the story. And I wanted to quote Travis again, where he's talking about this subculture being a complete inspiration. He said, and quote, a grand experiment, if you will, in what it is like to liberate yourself from the drudgery of the 20th century nine to five kind of narrative. What happens when you have enough money to break yourself free and pursue a life driven by your own values, as opposed to the values of a culture that were handed to you at birth? What does that mean? What are you capable of? And to me, it's that last part. What are you capable of? So many of us don't even take a step back and think about who we are. It's just, we are on autopilot. But when you can break free, you can actually decide how you want to live those years. And that is just extraordinarily powerful. And Brad, as you speak about our community, you know, and Brad, as we talk about our community, that, that quote that you've mentioned in the past comes directly to mind. And it's a Margaret Mead quote. And it says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. That's our community. That's our tribe. That is the ambassadors of this. This is yet another tool that allows us to reach that next person with this idea. And honestly, isn't it what we all want? You know, Phi has the tendency, especially as you go farther and farther down it, to be incredibly unselfish because you desperately want to be surrounded by a group of people that are in a similar life place because it's very lonely to be the only person in your demographic that has reached financial independence. You're you're waving to people, hey, it's great over here. Come join us. This documentary just makes all of that a little bit easier. And yeah, I just also wanted to point out like the amazing nature of how Travis originally a couple years ago at the Chautauqua thought about creating a documentary, right? And he was so far down the line that he had lined up potential guests. He had talked to Jim Collins and Mr. Money Mustache and Brandon Madfintus about being on this documentary. And then just a quirk of fate in his life where he got put on another project in his, in his day job and he had to put down the doc. You know, maybe on some level he probably thought this is never going to happen, right? I'm, I'm, I'm always going to be too busy or yada, 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 right? Like whatever. But that was in the past. But then just again, in this bizarre quirk of fate, he heard Scott Rickens talking about a Fi documentary on our podcast. He said, that's my doc. That's my thing. And, and instead of having that scarcity mindset of, oh, this is my idea, grumble, 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 right? Like th- I'm pissed off that I lost my idea. He said, no, I'm going to get in touch with Scott immediately. And they sat down and had lunch 
And all of a sudden, Travis is on the project. And now they have these dueling concepts and inspirations behind the documentary. And it's just utterly brilliant. Like they're they're just a wonderful team. We've seen them in action and it's going to make a better product. And what a cool thing. I mean, from our own perspective, Jonathan, right? Like it's, it's bizarre to hear that Travis heard about this on our podcast and now he's involved in this intimate, intimate level in this project. And, and really like that is, that's just such a neat thing. I, that still, honestly, it's hard to wrap my mind around sometimes. You know, and Scott's an artist and I have so much respect for what he does and just who he is as a person. But I can tell you, I've talked to Scott many times offline and he is blown away by Travis's just abilities as a storyteller, his natural ability to put weave these individual threads in a way that make you care deeply about the characters involved. Actually, I have a voicemail from Scott that I was going to go ahead and play today. If we have a second, I can pull it up right now. Yeah, let's do it. That sounds great. Hey guys, Scott Rickens here. Uh, I wanted to call in and, and say thank you. Thank you for having Travis on the podcast. Um, I would not have met him if it weren't for you guys believing in me, believing in this project. And I really enjoyed listening to his episode and his outlook on fire and on life in general. We've enjoyed so many conversations together and I've learned countless lessons from him. Uh, he's kept us in check when we've fallen into old habits. He's supported me when I've doubted my decisions. And one thing that he said to me early on in this project was renunciation is freedom. That has stuck with me during times of sacrifice and times of rejoice. This community is renouncing things that weigh them down, choosing freedom and happiness over mindless spending and poor decision-making. Taylor and I are getting better and better at scrutinizing and questioning our own choices. And we have this community to thank. And so I wanted to, I wanted to say thank you, Phi community. We've already found amazing lifelong friends in this journey. We've gained so much spirit, inspiration, and hope uh, from those who have offered their support, shared their stories, and wished us well. And we are more determined than ever to bring this story of this movement to the big screen. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. And I want you to know, I want you all to know that we are in this together. I can't wait to see what the future holds for this group of amazing people. And I can't wait to share our work with you and with the world. So Brad, Jonathan, keep up the amazing work. This community goes grows stronger every day because of you guys. And I know I speak for everyone when I say, Keep going, guys. This is awesome. Onward. Onward. That's that's perfect. That's exactly what we're doing. That's why we're here twice a week. That's what this is about. It's continuing to motivate and inspire you guys because this is our journey. This is your journey. And this documentary reflects how passionate we are as a community. Yeah. And for everyone out there that wants to check out uh, their website, it's playingwithfire.co. So playingwithfire.co and you can sign up for their newsletter. Scott's got a bunch of good content up there and I know they're adding a significant amount more in the coming months uh, as the doc gets closer. And I think uh, they're targeting the tail end of 2018, if not maybe into the beginning of 2019 for the, the full release. So of course, we'll keep everyone updated as the months go by and as we get closer. And yeah, Jonathan, I just wanted to mention one other thing that I thought was amazing about, about Travis's story, which was really that hilarious story about like him getting it wrong, right? Quote unquote, and saving 90% of all of his raises. Pay yourself and, first. It's so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> how amazing is that? I hope that story came through clearly on on the podcast because like this is remarkable. I mean, he was living a lifestyle where he wasn't making all that much money, you know, at the at the beginning of this when when he was learning and going on this financial journey for the beginning and he just got it slightly wrong, right? Instead of saving 10%, he was saving 90% of all of his future raises. So he eventually got to the point where when he started making a lot more money, he had been saving 90% of all that money and all those raises in the intervening years. He got to the point where he was saving 85 plus percent of his income just by getting it wrong. That is it's just such an amazing, funny story that just not having the math brain as he described it, just 
helped him get to Phi many, many years earlier than if he had followed the real advice, which was save a fairly meager 10%, even though, albeit that's better than most people save, unfortunately, but but meager for the Phi community. And and what a, what a funny, quirky story, right? It really was. You know, I've I had a couple of conversations with Scott, you know, offline and I, and I asked him, I know you're tied to this. I know you're super biased, but take the 10,000 foot view and try to look at what you've put together just, you know, from the outside. How big of a deal is this project? And he tried. He's like, yeah, I, that's really that's a tough ask, but it's huge, dude. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. The footage that's come together is blowing my mind. And JL Collins is going out to meet them in Portland uh, just in a couple weeks here to film his part. You know, you mentioned Chautauqua being an important part of Travis's own Fi journey. And these characters that we are all are so passionate about are involved in this project. I mean, this really is it. So for those of you that are hearing this for the first time and are like, uh, documentary, what documentary? Well, we're first referring to the episode, which was 62, this past Monday with Travis Shakespeare. But prior to that, we actually featured Scott Rickens, who shared his entire story and the story of what this documentary is going to be. That was episode 37. Uh, So both of those, check them out if you're interested in more information on the documentary. But it's certainly something that you'll hear about over the next several months as we continue to keep you guys in the loop. I guess tied to that, I mentioned Chautauqua. I did want to mention that these tickets are going to sell out and we would love for a large percentage of our community to be there or have the option to be there. So so if you're at all interested, please don't wait. Go to choosefi.com slash Greece. That'll take you directly to the page where you can find out information and purchase a ticket to Chautauqua. It's going to be at the foot of Mount Olympus in Greece this October. There's two weekends that are open. I believe there's only 30 spots in each weekend. So there's there's absolutely no more than 60 tickets total combined. And if you want to go, we would love to see you there. Chooseify.com slash Greece. Yeah. And Jonathan, I'm even more excited than I was. We actually just a couple of days ago, recorded a Monday episode with Jim Collins, with Mr. 1500, with Christy and Bryce from Millennial Revolution, and Katie and Alan Donegan. It was about Chautauqua, and we're actually releasing that in 10 days. So it'll be the 26th. What an amazing story to hear the history of Chautauqua, just to hear their takeaways from prior events. Both you and I have never been I've heard about it for years. We actually pulled up an old comment that I had from 2013 on a Mr. Money Mustache post where I basically said, like, this sounds like the community that I've been waiting for. What's so interesting is to look back on that five years later and say, like, basically all the ideas of community that I've talked about on this podcast over and over and over again, that seed came from this Mr. Money Mustache post on Chautauqua nearly five years ago. And I just thought it was such a cool thing. Uh, So yeah, I mean, needless to say, I am extraordinarily excited to be going and to be speaking there makes it even more special. So like Jonathan said, if you're at all interested and you want to attend, it's choosefi.com forward slash Greece, and that'll take you to the webpage. And Brad, I love that you mentioned that this is the community that I've been looking for specifically because This is something that me and you have gone all in on over the last year. And in particular, these local groups really starting to take off. And the reason I mention this now is I got a very pertinent voicemail from Terry that I'm going to go ahead and play. Hello, my name is Terry Shaughnessy. I just choose Fi a little while ago through Dave Ramsey and Dave Ramsey Legacy Steppers and and a few other odds and end websites. And I just love it. The main question I have is how to start up a local group. I live in a town, Columbus, Georgia. The nearest local group is either Atlanta or Birmingham, Atlanta, Georgia, or Birmingham, Alabama, both just too far away. Um, And I'd like to join forces with some local folks. So if I have to be the uh, gatherer, I'd love to do so. And um, I just want to know how to uh, start a local group. And um, I'll give you my email and whatever else after that. But, yeah, I'd love to have a conversation with someone at Choose Five about starting a local group. Thank you. 
So Terry, this is exactly what we're looking for. And obviously when we started the local groups, we started in the areas where most of our community was, and then we're spreading out from there. And this is the exact type of feedback that we're looking for. Where is their interest for the next one? And it's a very simple process. If you want to start a local group, you just need to email us at feedback at choosefi.com. Uh, there are a couple requirements. So one, you do have to be willing to be the admin. Uh, Brad and I cannot manage more than 100 groups around the world. We need help. So you need to say, hey, I am from Blacksburg, Virginia, and I would love to have a local group in my area. I'm willing to help be the admin. From there, I will set up the group. I'll get you added to it, and you will be the admin. Then I will add it to the local pages so people can find the group, and we'll start promoting it for you. That way, it makes it very easy for people to find uh, we also put you into a, a admin group itself so we can help figure out how to make the groups better over time. And honestly, Brad, this is something that I was talking to you about recently. In my mind, this starts to replace rotary groups. I mean, this is what mastermind entrepreneur groups, this is what building, optimizing your specific city actually looks like. And it just starts with one person being willing to say, I see the value and I'd like to see something start in my local community. Yeah, and it's been amazing to see how many communities have popped up throughout the world. It's hard to believe when we when we brainstormed this idea that we'd have so many thousands of people involved and so many amazing admins willing to step up and help us. And yeah, it's just, it, it's pretty wild to hear some of these stories where we actually just had a, a Richmond meetup recently and uh, we met a woman named Dabney. She told us that her friend Stacy from the Choose FI San Diego group was the one who got her into FI generally and Choose FI. And Stacy said, oh my God, you have to go to the Richmond local meetup. That's where Brad and Jonathan are and how cool. It was just, just a neat little story because San Diego is actually probably our most active local community. They're having events all over the place. They have, I think a couple hundred people in that group. Yeah, it's just neat that they're spreading the word and it's even impacting our own local group here in Richmond. So I uh, just thought that was a, a cool and funny little story. And and yeah, Jonathan, just to add to what you said before, uh, people who are interested in starting up a local group, definitely check out the local page first. So choosefi.com forward slash local. And that's your first step. See if there is a local group near you. If there's not one that's terribly close, like in, in Terry's case, then consider starting up a group. And it doesn't have to be 200 people plus like San Diego. It can be a smaller city, a smaller town where maybe there's only going to be five or 10 of you, but that's a pretty tight and close knit community. So yeah, we'd love, love to expand this and we'd love to see more of these communities. So Brad, one of the benefits of my co-host being a, an accountant, even if you aren't really a huge fan of taxes generally, is that I can lean on you and ask you questions as I try to help my wife start up a business or a side hustle. And so we've been working on doing this audiobook narration. And I was going to ask you these questions, you know, offline, but I realized that's what this whole show is about. And instead of having to go find an accountant in my area, which I still am going to do at some point, but if I have just a simple question, I should just be asking you and turning it into a conversation. And so let me tell you where I'm at with Danny and with this audiobook business. We, we just got it up and rolling. We did have to, there were a few expenses that we had to put in place, you know, a couple hundred dollars, 200 to $500 of expenses. And so far, I think we've made $5 and 73 cents of income, but, <laughs> but you know, it's a start. There has been some movement of the needle. And I guess what I'm wondering is I realize that there probably should be a little bit of a stepwise process for that person that is maybe starting a business and is wondering, what do I need to actually track? How much do I need to track? And I'd love to get just your general thoughts for the startup entrepreneur with maybe a couple hundred dollars of expenses to get the thing rolling and just now starting to get their first little bit of income. What would be your thoughts about tracking that? Yeah, that's a good question, Jonathan. I, I think tracking is the most important word you use there because this doesn't have to be complicated. And to me, it's just, it's just simple bookkeeping. It's simple record keeping. And you don't, especially on a new side hustle that, that you're not really sure where it's going to go. Like, I think, I think you asked me previously, do we need to go out and get an LLC? Do we need a business bank account? Do we need a credit card? All, all this kind of stuff. The answer is you don't need that right away. I mean, that it's, it's personal preference because also like it's fairly easy to set up an LLC, even if you did want to just to, to have that separation. But like in Virginia, I think 
it cost a hundred dollars to set up an LLC. And I know I got my paperwork within a handful of days. And then you can open up a business bank account if you want. You're you're a legitimate business there. So I mean that's that's certainly an option, but but you really, really don't need to do that at the beginning. To me, it's just a matter of creating a simple Excel sheet. And I pulled up I pulled up the Excel sheet that I created five years ago for my first business. And I still use this for all three of my businesses. I don't, I don't use any kind of fancy accounting software. I just use a very simple Excel spreadsheet. I have one tab that tracks the bank balance. So it's, it's basically just a bank ledger. And I, I just take my beginning of the year balance, which at the beginning of a business, it would be zero and just track inflows and outflows from the bank account. And that's just real simple. You get your statement or you just log into your bank and and see your activity there. So I just use that to kind of tie everything together. And then I just have a sheet for expenses and a worksheet for revenue. You know, I, I, I do have a, a summary tab at the end just to tie it together, but that's my own accountant's uh, brain working. You really don't need that right away. But expenses are the key, just tracking that. So any legitimate business expense, any kind of expense you have that's related to the business, purchasing any kind of materials, like in your case, if you made that that sound closet for Danny, print out your invoices, that's the crucial part, all right? So those are all legitimate business expenses, but basically you want to keep a record of them. Just like I, I've mentioned this so many times on the podcast, you don't wanna to have to reinvent the wheel and frantically try to go back and find every expense and try to do it after the fact. Just if you do it as you're ongoing, it's so much easier to track. And, you know, frankly, like I know I said, you don't need a business bank account. It does make it that much cleaner though, if you did happen to have one, because then every single income and expense item for that business is captured in that bank account. And it just makes it that much cleaner. So, you know, if that's something that appeals to you, it, it definitely appeals to my mind. That was one of the main reasons why I did open up an LLC. In my eyes, there's no tax benefit. There's maybe, maybe some legal protections, but I wasn't particularly worried about being sued when I started a business, you know, five years ago. It was just, it, it was more just to keep track of everything. So uh, again, I literally print out the invoices. So I have a list on this expenses. I number them. I have a column that says print and I put a yes when it's printed. So, I mean, this is as rudimentary as it gets, but it's just, for me, the columns are date, who the payee was, the amount, then the method, just so I, I know is PayPal, is it credit card, is it debit card, then print, and then the numbering system. So for my business last year, this one particular business, I had like 112 expenses. So I literally have an Excel sheet with 112 line items. There's a yes in that column. And then for each individual one saying I printed it out and then I have a stack with a big clip on it that has 112 printed invoices. So to me, it's like if I ever got audited by the IRS, they would come in, I would literally show them this document. I would have all my income, all my expense items that tie directly to the 1099s and the tax return. And I would be able to hand that auditor this stack of 112 invoices and that would be that it would tie to the penny. And that is just so simple when you're doing it on an ongoing basis. There's nothing, there's nothing to this, but if I waited until the end of the year and maybe if I didn't have this business bank account to make it even easier, it would be torture to go back and try to recreate all the expenses, dig them out of my Amazon account or out of my email. Like that's just so such effort. So like to me, it's the first of every month I go through and take an hour and just document everything. And, and frankly, I probably spend more time than if I used a, an accounting software that did this automatically. But for me, it enables me to like get in there and just see what's going on in my business. And on some weird perverse level, I find it fun. And, and I, I like just printing this out, knowing that I am documented to the penny and it's such an easy process. So, I mean, Jonathan, does that make sense? Any, any questions jump out to you? It totally does. I guarantee you people's minds are spinning and they're thinking, wow, I need to redo everything that I've done to this year. I think that as an accountant, you take for granted how much bandwidth that gives you in the rest of your life as a business owner by taking those small steps, you know, every little bit of the way. I think there are people in our community that are going to be messaging you directly about this. And I would say, 
instead of doing that, you know, and you having to reply to each one of those <laughs> emails, <don't>. yeah, <laughs> what I will get Brad to do is maybe recreate this Excel sheet as a video tutorial over the next several months. We'll put it up on our YouTube channel so you can see exactly how it works. And then on the show, we'll try to continue to explore this. Now, I want to say that as a business owner, there is a point in time at which you still want an accountant because you do not want to deal with this. An accountant is an essential member of your team. But I think too many of us don't realize what control we have over those first few months. You know, when you have no income, then at this point, that's probably not the right time to start bringing in an accountant. You probably can manage it just with being willing to do just a little bit of research about how to build a P&L statement, about how to build a simple Excel sheet like what Brad is talking about. That's probably enough to get you started. And then from there, you can start adding in some of the tools that hopefully I can get Brad. And it's amazing to me, like Brad himself will say, I love accountancy, but I'm uninspired when it comes to taxes, right? I mean, so he, you heard him specifically say the end of the, at the end of the year, he will get this statement down to the penny matching up to all the 1099s. Like he's brilliant at it, but like for whatever reason, he hasn't grabbed this mantle. I will force it on him and we will get a chance to explore all these little hacks that he just takes for granted. I mean, even right now, he's trying to make it sound like it's so easy and so obvious. It's not easy. It's not obvious. Most business owners and most small businesses that are just, you know, startups first year, they fail because people do not account for both what they need to reserve for taxes and how to keep track of these expenses. So my job as the grounded person that does not get accountancy, does, that this does not come naturally to, is to try to get Brad to take a little bit more ownership of this and turn it into a conversation. Deal, Brad? Yeah, I think I can handle that. I, and uninspired is a good way of putting it as far as tax goes. I, uh, I pretty much loathe tax and don't know how I got into that as a career. But uh, as far as like the actual bookkeeping and like this type of accountancy, I really do kind of enjoy it, which is kind of sad to say out loud. But th- there's some pleasure for me in, in this being so simple, just like anything. I'm always talking about how I crave simplicity in life. For me, it's like when I can tie everything to the penny without really working too hard, that's a pretty good feeling, knowing that if I ever did get audited, I would wow with that auditor just by handing them this stack of, in this case, 112 invoices that tie to the penny that everyone is substantiated as a legitimate business expense. And here it is. Go audit. Have fun. They would literally walk out and say, OK, you win. Right. Like <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That's so perfect. <laughs> I can't wait to continue this conversation because there is more here. And the problem is you can't go at it all at once. You have to piecemeal it. And that's why, you know, you guys are listening to this show because you've enjoyed slowly getting that one thing. And I realized over the last couple of months, as I was helping Danny build this business and I no longer have, you know, Brad handling my accountancy for me with regards to this small little side hustle that even though I'm on the other side of this, I still don't know what the heck I'm doing. I know enough to track, but You know, I've kind of leaned on Brad up to this point and he has, I have not been able to extract it out of him. So by again, sandbagging you brother on the show, we're going to pull all these extra little bits out that people will actually benefit from. This is very valuable information. Cool. Well, that sounds good. I'm happy to help. And kind of a a segue into our, our next voicemail is talking about me being uninspired as far as tax goes. That just doesn't light me up. But we actually met someone recently named Shane Mason. He has a site called ShaneMasonCPA.com. Actually, he's working with Ali Jane, who we met. Jonathan, you and I were on the her podcast called Money Splained. They're working on a, a project called BrooklynFI.com. And I think it's going to be some type of, of accountancy and also financial advising. So I'm interested to see like how they bring that to the FI community. But yeah, we got introduced to Shane and I was talking to him about the new tax law. And the part that intrigues me the most is the the QBI, the qualified business income deduction. And I just don't know enough about it. I mean, at this point, it, it is a little bit too new for, for any of us to have really dove into it. And at this point, it, there are still some uncertainties. So I, I haven't spent a ton of time trying to figure it out, but this is for the pass through entities. So as I understand it, you know, pass through our S corps and LLCs generally. Uh, but the question is still out on, on who can benefit from this. And it's evidently a 20% and many of you probably saw this in the news, but it's 20% of your business income for this qualified business income deduction is basically just taken off the top. So it's lopped off the top of your of your net income for these pass-through entities. 
to me, this is could be a bonanza for small businesses. But again, I don't know the rules. So we actually reached out to Shane and he put together this really, really detailed voicemail. This is something that it might take a couple of listens for all of us to really wrap our minds around. But this is big bucks potentially for many of us. So I say, let's all take a listen and any questions we have, let's talk about them in the Facebook group. We can get Shane back on the horn and he can record another voicemail or we could just have him on the podcast and, and we can talk through this. But a lot of people have asked for information about the new tax law. And yeah, I think this is the perfect first step because it is such a game changer for small businesses. Hi, I'm Shane Mason. I'm a CPA and certified financial planner based in Brooklyn, New York. I own Mason Tax, which specializes in helping freelancers and small business owners minimize their tax bill. I recently founded Brooklyn FI as well, which is a fee-only financial planning firm focused on helping creatives reach financial independence. I have seven years experience working in the public accounting world, but I'm happy to report that I quit my job in December to work for myself full-time. My FI plan is to be financially independent, living on a sailboat by age 45. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the new qualified business income deduction. This is a brand new element of the new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, which is going to give a lot of benefits to small business owners, people that either own sole proprietorships, LLCs, S corporations, and partnerships. Um, they have access to this new, this wonderful new deduction, uh, which is essentially a twenty percent haircut off the top of their income. So. Um, taxpayers that are earning $100,000 through a qualified business have the ability to take a deduction for 20% of that income. So we're looking at a $20,000 deduction. So instead of being taxed on $100,000 of income, we're only going to be taxed on $80,000 of income, which is a lovely new tax deduction to reduce your tax bill. So what are some of the details on this new deduction? Uh, There are some limitations based on income that we'll get into in the future. Specifically, there are special types of service businesses that are limited. Uh, There's a limitation for certain businesses that they're carved out of the ability to take this deduction, which means that the deduction is available to all businesses except for these specifically. And those are businesses where the main driver of revenue for that business is the skills or reputation of the people earning that income. So it's a specified service business. And this is mostly going to be professional services businesses. This deduction was designed to help manufacturing in the United States, basically. So they've carved out people that aren't manufacturing anything. They're just selling their services to prevent uh, you and I, people that have uh, day jobs from leaving their day job and going back to their employer and saying, hey, I'm now a freelancer. So I want this deduction. So that is when that's something that is designed that people will do specifically for a tax break. And Congress doesn't really like for people to let the tail wag the dog, so to speak, and people do things just for tax deductions. So anyway, these specified service businesses, some of the more common ones are going to be lawyers, uh, accountants such as myself, financial professionals, doctors, and there's this catch-all for consultants. So that's where uh, we're not really sure what specific types of jobs are going to be subject to this restriction, a specified service business. Congress wrote the law. The IRS is currently enforcing it. But the tax court is eventually going to be the one that decides who falls under this umbrella of who doesn't get the deduction. But keep in mind that those specified service trader businesses can still take the deduction as long as they don't make too much money. So how much money is too much money? Well, if you're single, it's different than if you're married. If you're single, it's $157,500, $157,000. And that's total income, not just your income from your qualified business. So if you made $100,000 in wages and then $50,000 from your business, you're underneath that $157,000 limitation. So nothing to worry about. You can still take a 20% deduction against that $50,000 of income from your side hustle. And then it phases out over the next $50,000 up from one fifty seven. So if you make 207000 then you are completely at the end of the phase out. So you don't get to take any of the deduction. Uh, for married individuals, those numbers are doubled. Um, so you, the phase out starts at three fifteen, and it spreads out over a hundred thousand dollars of income above that. So if you make more than four hundred fifteen thousand, you get none of the deduction. Okay, and we'll talk about strategies for avoiding that phase out in the future. So that is the case for specified service businesses. If you don't have a specified service business, then you you still have the ability to take this deduction if you go over those thresholds that I just talked about. But there's new limitations on you now, so you can make. 
too much money if you don't have a qual- specified service trader business, as long as you have other types of expenses available. So if you have wages, that will help you with the limitation, or if you have depreciable property, that all helps you with the limitation. What Congress is trying to do here is they're trying to create, help businesses out that are employing other people or buying property or putting property into use for businesses. Okay, so if you have one of these, let's, let's use an example here to get concrete. So let's say that you have have a rental property, which I imagine that will be the most common type of small business that taxpayers have um, that is not a specified service trader business. Okay. So if you have this rental property, you can take this qualified business income deduction, whether it's a sole proprietorship, uh, you have it in an LLC, tax as a partnership, or you have it in an S corporation. Not available for C corps, so that's not a flow through entity. So this does not get qualify as qualified business income. Okay, so back to the example. Let's say that you earned two hundred and twenty thousand. Let's say you're single and you have income from this property of two hundred and twenty thousand dollars after expenses. Okay, so you're you would hope to take. haircut off of that income, right? That's $44,000 that you could take as a deduction that would not be taxable. That's wonderful, right? Well, we have to think about the limitations now because that $220,000 of income is above the phase-out thresholds that I talked about before. Okay, so how do we save ourselves? Well, if we had paid someone wages, we could take 50% of those wages would help us take the deduction, would be available as a deduction. So if we paid someone $40,000 in wages, we could take $20,000 as the deduction, even though the max was $44,000 we talked about earlier. Um, That's 20% of the two twenty dollars to bring it back. If we paid someone $40,000 in wages, we could take only $20,000 of the deduction. The other thing that could save us is 2.5% of the cost of the property serves the same purpose as those wages that we talked about. So if we had a million dollar building, two and a half percent of that building would be available to raise the limitation on the deduction. So two and a half percent of a million dollars is 25,000. So of the $44,000 deduction that we were talking about earlier, we're limited by two and a half percent of the cost of the property. Two and a half percent in this example of a million dollar business of building that you own that you're renting out to generate this income. Two and a half percent of that is twenty five thousand. So we won't get to take the full forty four thousand. We will be able to take a deduction of twenty five thousand because that's two and a half percent of the basis of the property of the cost of the property. If we had paid wages to somebody, let's say of eighty eight thousand or a hundred thousand dollars we would be entitled to 50% of those wages as a deduction. So let's say that's 50% of 100,000 of wages is 50,000. We're still capped at the 44,000 of qualified business income because that's 20% of your income from the company. But the wages help us here, basically. Okay, so that's the nitty gritty of how this works. Now let's talk about some questions I'm anticipating and I have received from other people about this. So question one, do you have to have an LLC or an S corporation to take this deduction? You don't have to have it. We already said that you could be a sole proprietor, you can be taxed as a partnership, you could be taxed as a S corporation. This is not available to C corps. We'll talk about why S corps are probably the best choice for strategies within for maximizing our qualified business income deduction in just a moment. Okay. So second question is what happens if I have other types of income besides this business income? Well, as I mentioned before, if you have other income, the deduction that the $157,000 phase out that I was talking about for single individuals is includes the, the business income, but also your other income. So if you only have $150,000 of qualified business income, you're, you're golden. You're, you're good to go here. If you have $150,000 of qualified business income on top of your $100,000 of wages from your day job, then you are completely phased out. And if the QBI income is related to a specified service business, then no wages or basis or cost of a building is going to help you with that limitation because specified service businesses are specifically phased out of this. No saving them. All right. Question three, what happens if I have multiple businesses? Well, all of the business income is lumped together. So if you have one business with $20,000 of qualified business income and another with 70, then your QBI deduction is going to be 20% of $90,000. All right. Question four, where does this deduction even happen in the world? (laughs) 
Okay. So if you have, you're going to have, a lot of you have separate business returns. You got a 1065 for your partnership. You got an S corporation, uh, form 1120S. The deduction does not happen on those entities' returns. It happens on the individual that owns that business's return uh, because the deduction is based on each individual taxpayer's income. Uh, so like those people's other income will affect whether or not they're available, whether this deduction is available. So a partnership, there could be a partnership with 15 people in it and it will carve up its income among those 15 people. The partnership has no idea who is entitled of the partners in that partnership, who's entitled to the deduction. That's all determined at the individual's level. If you're really tight with your partners in your company, you can look at who has access to this deduction and allocate income appropriately, but I recommend talking to an accountant about that. Okay, what if I have business losses in one of my businesses and income in another? Well, they'll balance each other out. The loss in one company will reduce the ability of the other company's ability to take this deduction. So if you have $20,000 loss in one company, uh, $70,000 of income in another, uh, then you can only take 20% of 50000 And any losses that aren't used in one year will be carried forward into the future to limit your QBI deduction in the future. So be careful about that. All right, what if my spouse is pushing our income past the thresholds? So what if somebody makes $150,000 of qualified business income? They're in the gold. Doesn't matter if they have wages or not. They're in the clear there. Um, They're not limited. But their spouse has $300,000 because they're an attorney and they're killing it. Well, that spouse is limiting their qualified business income deduction. So what you could do to prevent that limitation is file a married filing separate tax return, which used to be very rare in the tax filing community because there's a lot of deductions that are limited if you file separately. Um, Well, I predict there's going to be a lot more uh, separate returns in the future based on the ability of maximizing this QBI deduction. Do capital gains from my business, let's say I own an investment partnership, do capital gains qualify as qualified business income? No, only ordinary income, uh, no capital gains, no dividends, uh, no annuity income, none of that weird passive stuff that's taxed at preferential rates is going to be available as a QBI deduction. Remember, Congress is trying to get people to put money to work. So trying to hire people, we're trying to build buildings, etc. Okay, last question. Can I pay myself a wage? Because I know that I could be limited on my, by my wages if I have too much income. Yes, you can pay yourself a wage, but you have to have one specific business type to pay yourself a wage, and that's an S corporation. So while a lot of people are hyped about this new deduction, their partnership is going to have access to it, they might want to think about forming an S corporation to pay themselves a wage to help maximize that deduction. Okay, so while the old business entity might have made sense, a new one might make more sense. And if you were a sole proprietor and you're making you're making good money, you're making more than that 157, it might be time to form that S corporation, not only to pay yourself wages to help maximize the QBI deduction, but also to minimize payroll taxes, which is a whole nother strategy that we can talk about another time. All right. So look, in summary. To wrap all this up, if you're a sole proprietor, if you're a freelancer, if you have a small business that's making less than 157000 you now are taxed on 20% less than that. And if you're making more than that, then there's you should talk to an expert because there's a big new deduction available to you. And in this first year, you're going to want somebody to guide you. And that is going to be valuable. Brad, talk about level two. You don't know what you don't know until you do. And then forming a strong team, right? Yeah, this was amazing. I mean, that was a really, really detailed voicemail by Shane. So thank you for the the information. I suspect people are, their minds are going to be blown when they hear that. They're going to have to listen to it a couple of times, but, but this is ultra valuable. And, and what he talked about there at the end with the S Corp, I think a lot of people, that's going to open a lot of people's eyes that, Hey, even if I do make more than those limitations, there are still options here. And also you can also save on the payroll tax as well, as he alluded to, which is something we've mentioned on previous episodes where that's a a significant, significant savings potentially. So it looks like that could be a real plausible option for a lot of people. Now, naturally, forming an S-Corp or converting uh, to be taxed as an S-Corp, it requires a little bit more work 
and you have to file payroll tax returns, et cetera. But if you find a competent accountant, you can outsource that. That's an instance where I know I personally would outsource that. That's not something I want to do myself, but net savings of this could be enormous potentially for people. So this is a really crucial thing. And yeah, again, if you have questions, put them in the Facebook group and let us know and we can get Shane back on to talk about this. Oh, and clearly, even if you don't have questions, we are going to have Shane back on because that that rocked, buddy. Thank you so much for honestly, the detail you went in that answer. I, I couldn't have anticipated that. Really, really cool stuff. All right, guys. Well, unfortunately, that's going to bring this episode to a close. I kind of had a funny little anecdote that I wanted to share with you. We got an email from a company that was interested in sponsoring our show. And as you guys know, we don't do a whole lot of sponsorships. We prefer just to tell you about products that we have found useful along the way. Just it's more congruent with what we're about personally. But this company hopped on the phone with me and said, how the heck did you get 820 written reviews in one year? We have talk to hundreds of podcasts and we've never seen anything like that. And I realized that the growth that we have had on the show is entirely responsible to the engagement of our audience and our community. Uh, You guys have driven this beyond anything that Brad and I could have ever anticipated or hoped for. It has changed the bar permanently for the podcasting space. And it's, it's truly, I'm saying this from a place of gratitude. It, it blows my mind. We are at 820 reviews now. Is there any chance we could get to 1,000 over the next couple of weeks? Would you guys be willing to help us with this? As you know, this is something that we kind of market a little bit every single Friday. We do a drawing for a book that we found useful. And it's basically what Brad and I have always described as a virtuous circle. You help us out by leaving us a written review, and in some way, we can give back by doing this book drawing. We don't push it super hard, but I'm wondering, would you be willing, if you've been thinking about it, you've been meaning to, but life just got in the way, would you be willing to leave us a written review this week? Just go on to choosefi.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there, leave us a short written review. Just let, you know, it could be short or long. Just let us know maybe one thing that you like about the show that you're getting value it really has, it's changed the landscape and it's provided Choose FI opportunities that we never could have dreamed of when we started this. And it's all the different ways that we say that we're getting engaged. Honestly, this call from the sponsor made me realize that this is it. This is the number one way that you can help us just take one minute and leave us an iTunes written review. And coming back to today's show, you know, we do one book for every five written reviews that we get. So Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have two winners today. And the first winner is Jeff, and he called this the best five podcast. I listen to a lot of personal finance podcasts, and this one has the most actionable items out of all the ones that I've gone through. I have binge listened to every episode of the podcast from zero to 61R in just two weeks. This has been an incredibly eye-opening process as I've learned about Fi. Their podcast even got me to take a leap and step out of my comfort zone and start my own blog. Keep up the great work, guys. Love all the information you are sharing. And let us know in the Facebook group what the name of your blog is. We'd love to check it out. All right, Jonathan, the next winner is Melissa. And Melissa says, get 1% better every day with this podcast. I found myself drawn to Jonathan and Brad's podcast for the expert, actionable advice on five topics ranging from investment strategy to house hacking. But I stay in no small part for the discussion of mindset and the community they're creating. Listening to the podcast really hits home that we're all in this together. Interspersed with helpful and actionable advice on the topic of the week, Jonathan and Brad focus on how they and listeners can try to get 1% better each and every day and how these tiny steps can lead to giant progress. Choose FI's focus on actionable advice, small wins, and asking listeners to focus on what it is they value in their FI journey makes this one of the most approachable FI blog podcasts I've ever encountered. And listening has helped me implement both their tips and tricks and that of other FI folks. Make no mistake. This podcast isn't just for newbies. It's fantastic for seasoned five folks who want to feel part of a larger community. However, I strongly recommend this as the perfect gateway podcast for someone who's new to FI and may not initially take to hardcore mustachianism. Give even a non fi curious person this podcast in a bit of time, and you may be surprised at what they cut from their budget next. Guys, thank you so much. The fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.